All right, guys, we're going to be looking at the Roaring Twenties, right? Uh, the Roaring Twenties are all going to be about the idea of conflict, right, with a sort of traditional, traditional versus modern, right, and all that that entails. So, like, urban versus rural, new versus old, all that good stuff. And we got... You know, Leo here is Jay Gatsby, right? Um, <clears throat> kind of personifying uh, the Roaring Twenties. So the idea here is that the modern temper, right, is this movement towards modernity or modernism. And modernism just means we're going to be, you know, out with the old, right? That kind of idea. Uh, the technical definition is a style or movement in the arts that aims to break away from classical and traditional forms. And so in doing that, right, we're going to see tremendous change. We're going to see, yet again, that social change of, like, women being more independent. Um, the ideas of sort of modern life, science versus superstition. Nativism is going to be big, right? The idea that, like, we want to protect our traditional way of life and thus eschew immigrants, right? And at the, the sort of the, the soundtrack for the period uh, is going to be jazz, right? Jazz, which is a sort of uniquely American um, um, art, you know, art form that starts it, it has its roots deep in African American culture, right? And it's one of those things that comes about because of the mixing and blending of cultures in the United States, uh, and is thus, like I was saying, something uniquely American. So we start here with nativism, right? Um, political radicals tended to be immigrants, realized that a lot of people during this time period came from places that did not have democracy. They had dictators or they, you know, people faced severe problems, right? And then facing those severe problems, they then come to the United States and want to ensure that they don't have to face those problems here. It's kind of like, um, you know, uh, how like traditionally say Cuban immigrants, right? Or super against communism. And so thus, when they come to the United States, they become very sort of conservative, right? And they usually are Republican to sh eschew anything sort of socialistic. Um, our man, uh, Sacco and Vanzetti here, um, we'll look at Sacco and Vanzetti in class. So I'm not going to spend a ton of time on it. But the, the quick version is this. They're both going to be um, immigrants uh, from Italy and... Um, one of them will come from a little bit better background than the other. <clears throat> One of them is going to be basically a, a leader in the local, I think it's anarchist party. We'll talk about anarchism in class as well. And um, they are both going to be wrongfully convicted of murdering a policeman and a, or a guard, I guess, and like a, a foreman at a job, right? And really, they're going to be run through the system and executed uh, without much... Um, without much thought given to the actual truth. Like the judge in the case is going to be an avowed nativist, right? Um, and basically say that, you know, Sacco and Vanzetti are like, what's wrong with America and all this sort of stuff. We'll look at it. And like the international community is going to be very disappointed in the way the United States handles it because these two men are going to be executed, even though they probably didn't uh, commit the crime. Uh, during this time period, right, we see bombings, right? You might remember the Haymarket Affair. We talked about that a few uh, chapters ago, right, in New York, or not New York, excuse me, in Chicago uh, during, I believe, May Day, which is a labor festival, right? Um, they had a, a public bombing, and the bombings were generally terroristic moves by these sort of anachronistic groups, which gave fuel, right, to the nativists. We see the Im Emergency Immigration Act, which is going to be the first one to set uh, quotas, right? And then um, also uh, we'll see the Immigration Act, also referred to as the Natural Origins Act. That is the 1924 one. And this one <clears throat> made the quotas stricter and permanent. And these, country, these were country by country limits were specifically designed to keep out undesirable ethnic groups and maintain America's character as a nation of Northern Western European folks, right? And so, you know, Southeastern Europe, say Greece, Italy, Hungary, those places were seen as non-desirable. Um, now, in continuing this movement of, say, nativism slash 
traditionalism, right? You can see this kind of all boiled into the same thing. And like, you can see connections with today as well, right? Like the idea of who are the people that are super anti-immigrant? Are they going to be always, um, you know, the most cosmopolitan? Sometimes they are, sometimes they're not, right? And so during this time period, you see the growth of the Ku Klux Klan, right? Um, modeled after the vigilante group during the Civil War. Now, the one during after the Civil War was sort of uniquely Southern, right? And Reconstruction South. But this one, this version of the Klan, is going to be all over the United States. Um, some of the biggest enrollments in the Klan are going to be in Pennsylvania and Ohio, right? We think of, um, yet again, as it being a Southern thing, but in reality, it was everywhere, right? And this sort of like, insidious sort of like undertone of the clan running things um, really, um, really undermined the ideas of democracy in the United States. Now, eventually it's going to fall apart. We'll talk about this also in class. But um, if you read the book uh, Freakonomics, it talks about how like um, the FBI utilized the um, local or the, the kids radio show Superman during this time period. Um, and made the Klan like the enemy in it, and we'll, we'll talk about it, but it helped to make the Klan unpopular on a certain level. Now, fundamentalism is going to be big during this time period, right? So fundamentalism, for you guys that don't know, is uh, usually a religious connotation that indicates unwavering attachment to a set of irreducible beliefs. However, fundamentalism has come to be applied to the tendency among certain groups, mainly those not exclusively in religion, that is characterized by markedly strict literalism as it is applied to certain spec, uh, specific scriptures, dogmas, ideologies, or strong sense of importance of maintaining in-group or out-group distinctions, leading to the emphasis of purity or the desire to return to a previous ideal, from which advocates uh, belief that members have strayed, rejection of diversity of opinion, um, uh, so forth and so on. The idea there being that, like, fundamentalism, it says right there, you hearken back to some sort of, like, belief that is unwavering, Right. Um, I don't remember what, I don't remember what comic book or superhero movie, but it was like only, you know, only, you know, it was basically like only the bad guys deal in absolutes, that kind of thing. And fundamentalism is that, right? The notion is, is that there's no, there's no right, there's no gray area for anything, right? It's all one way and it has to be this way, right? And we see this yet again pop up during this conflict of the time period with the social change that's going on, that rural versus urban. And each side is going to be, you know, fundamental in its own way, right? Not, <clears throat> excuse me, I have a drink of my coffee there. Um, a good example of this will be the Scopes Monkey Trial. You'll talk about this in English class too. It's a famous play called Inherit the Wind. And in it, well, John Scopes here, and this is, it's real life that they make the play about and they change the guy's names, but Scopes is the real biology teacher in, I want to say it's Tennessee, that <clears throat> is going to teach evolution, even though the school doesn't, the school district doesn't support that. So he is going to be fired by the school district. And eventually, um, famous attorneys come to represent both sides in this case. So Clarence Darrow, who you might remember we talked about in Devil in the White City, is going to show up and represent scopes and yet again kind of the urban and sort of modern viewpoint and william jennings bryant who we talked about before who if you didn't we don't really talk about this but he has a very long and sort of distinguished legal career besides being a politician um you might know the um famous case of lizzie borden right the axe murdering daughter well he represents lizzie borden in the uh in the case, I believe. Um, now, back to the Scopes Monkey Trail. Basically, in the end, right, it becomes this debate over rural versus urban, all this sort of stuff. And in the, the play and in real life, the the judge sides with the school district. Now, <clears throat> but it's a represent, yet again, of this idea of fundamentalism and is, yet again, the ideas of rural versus urban. We see the rise of prohibition. Also, that question of traditionalism what is good, what is bad, anti-immigrant, all these things are tied into it. Also, there's this movement inside of uh, the anti-saloon leagues and the women's temperance movement that are, um, that the kind of white upper class uh, was going to push away from alcohol. Well, the, the alcohol became a class thing. And so low class immigrants were the ones that drank and not the upper class, say, well-to-do people. Now, 
during this time period, right, when <clears throat> the Volstead Act goes into um, goes into uh, goes into effect, right, and you also have the effect of the Eighteenth Amendment. Um, the sale of alcohol is illegal. So is the production of alcohol. Well, the sale the sale and production of alcohol is illegal. The consumption of alcohol was not. So you see bootleggers. These guys need to make illegal alcohol outside of the law. Um, and we'll talk if you if you're interested in this stuff. We talk about it in the piracy and smuggling course that I teach. So sign up for that. Um, there's an anti-German sentiment. That's an anti-immigrant sentiment. All of these, this a lot of this illegal alcohol was going to be sold in speakeasies, which were underground bars. Now I don't mean underground like physically underground, more so like contraband, right? Um, they were they were outside of the law. Um, a lot of times they were supplied with alcohol by organized crime. This, this is the rise of Al Capone and the North Side Gang in Chicago. <clears throat> the St. Valentine's Day Massacre, all that good sort of stuff. Um, as it says right here, by 1931, commission reported that the enforcement had broken down. There weren't enough federal agents to enforce um, enforce prohibition. So famously, there's a place called Hamtrak, uh, Michigan, and it basically was a it's like a it was a Polish town in the United States. It was mostly Polish immigrants, and they just ignored the law, right? And eventually, the like government had to go in and like shut them down. Um, but you know, for all the Elliot Nesses, right, if you ever watched the uh, Untouchables, uh, more so there was just, there was a lack of people to enforce the law. So, you know, by the, by the 30s, uh, prohibition is going to be on its way out. Now, <clears throat> urban American uh, confronted provincial small town America with cultural conflict reached new levels. We see the art during this time period be very um, sort of young and upbeat, right? So we talked about jazz briefly. F. Scott Fitzgerald and The Great Gatsby, um, and it really influencing people like Gatsby in particular, right, and and what they refer to as the lost generation that Fitzgerald was a part of, are going to make these books with sort of like, it's kind of like, um, think of like The Wolf of Wall Street, right? The Wolf of Wall Street at the end of the day is a sort of morality tale that like, if you don't pay attention to it, that says, oh man, this guy's doing the wrong thing, Right. Uh, you get swept up in kind of all the glitz and glamour, and that's what sort of Gatsby's about, right? All the glitz and glamour are, you know, not fruitful. They're not fulfilling, right? And Gatsby kind of tells us that. Now, with this, right, we see these change in social norms, right? Um, <clears throat> sexuality is a bigger deal during this time period. Sex was discussed, as it says here, more frankly, right, more openly. If you take take note of the flappers over here, um, these women, right, would have been the modern women that would have had, you know, their own apartment, had their own job. They wouldn't have necessarily had um, <clears throat> men, right, to, to kind of tell them what to do, as we've discussed yet again, as we've moved towards this, as we were in the Gilded Age, where women were first starting to work, and now they've kind of reached this level of independence. Um, the changes in uh, fashion, right? We were just talking about the triangle shirtwaist factory, right? Those women were dressed from, you know, ankle to neck, right? And everything was covered. Well, now, you know, it's the norm for the lower half of the leg to be visual or visible. And in that, right, that's a big change. That The, the, the idea also with um, the dances and stuff, their dresses would flap back and forth. Yet again, not like the sort of, I want to say, frumpy conditions of their earlier clothes. But that was kind of what they had, right? Um, all of this, right, is also going to be sort of, uh, dissected by psycho psychoanalysis, which is going to be created in part by Sigmund Freud. Now, Freud's findings are a little bit out there because a lot of his tests were done on, um, uh, insane asylum patients, but the underlying ideas of what he said, uh, are important, right? The idea that like you can study the mind and, and, and help fix problems, that kind of thing. Um, sort of in this sort of freer society also women had um the right to vote now in 1920 the passage of the 19th amendment which we said got really going with the whole taxation you know without representation idea right that was a big aspect of that now um the harlem renaissance is going to happen during this time period i imagine um i imagine your english class is going to touch on this a little bit more but harlem became a 
sort of ground zero for this new sort of revival of African-American culture. And this also this idea that like made African-American culture, culture central to kind of like the American ideal. Like everybody was like kind of on board with it. Like, you know, kids, kids in the cities and places like that were going to be fired up by, you know, Langston Hughes poetry and listening to um, jazz and stuff like that. Now, um, we start to see also inside of this political movement. So you got Marcus Garvey, who's going to start the Black Star shipping line. And we talked about this briefly when we looked at Booker T. Washington and Du Bois, but Garvey, right, is going to call for like sort of like, uh, you know, it, this is a hearkening back to when I was a kid, but there used to be a, a fashion line called FUBU, right? And it was for us, by us, right? That was the, the sort of what the acronym was. But it was sort of an urban wear kind of thing that, namely African-American guys wore, but not everybody. But that was central to the idea of what Garvey was getting at. He wanted to have black communities that that had black businesses, and it was very much segregated from white communities. So at one point, he meets with the leader of the Ku Klux Klan, and is basically like, we have the same agenda. Now, Garvey's going to be a little bit of a charlatan and eventually go bankrupt. Um, But his notion there, yet again, was about empowering African-Americans. Du Bois, right... Uh, not on board with that, right? Du Bois was all about integration now, right? Um, in, in, in 1910, right, uh, the NAACP is going to get the uh, anti-lynching bill going. I want to say Thurgood Marshall is going to be part of that, but I'm not going to quote me on it. Thurgood Marshall might be down the road a little bit. Um, remember that a lot of states did not have laws um against that sort of vigilante justice, right? And as we looked when we were talking about, um, we were talking about Ida B. Wells and how a lot of times the um, lynchings came about not because of the African-American guys breaking any laws, but it was usually a way for anti-competition from black businesses, right? And so the, these these types of laws that would make those things illegal and actually give give people the, the teeth to prosecute that was important. Now, other stuff with modernism here, I'm going to go really fast through this, guys, but science becomes a big deal, right? Um, and so science was a way, as it says right here, progressivism fell victim to a series of frustrations, namely, right, World War I was this idea that, like, it made everybody question if we were really moving forward, right? But science really helped people begin to push, right, towards uh, a positive thing. So, you know, uh, back to Sir Isaac Newton, right, and his laws of physics, but that the, the world was governed by laws, and thus we could, you know, much like the ancient Greeks, that if we could discover these laws, it would make the world a better place. So we see the rise of the ideas of theory of relativity. Um, the theory of relativity, right, basically like that things are relative, um, namely um, things from a distance, right, move slower or faster perceived by the person looking at them. Um, what's going to be what's going to be interesting is Einstein is going to come up with this theory, but there's no way real, real way to prove it. Eventually, it's going to take like a solar eclipse and you can ask me about it in class if you want to. But um, that's going to be how they prove the theory of relativity, relativity s- several years after he published it. Um, but that's going to lead us to, you know, stuff about the atom and radioactivity. And, you know, that's going to lead us to Heisenberg and his, you know, uncertainty principle, which basically was saying that, like, in studying, you know, quantum mechanics, which is like the study of atoms and stuff like that, you can't, you can't know the position of an atom and its, and its momentum, right? So, like, you can do one or the other. <clears throat> All of this stuff, right, is going to lead us down the road to nuclear power slash nuclear nuclear bombs, right? We're not there yet, though. Margaret Mead is going to be a famous cultural anthropologist that's going to study um, people around the world and help to empower, yet again, the women's movement. Modernist art and literature, yet again, breaking away from traditional molds. And we see a lot of experimentation during this time period. So when modernist art during this time period, this is going to be the start to like, you know, Picasso and all that kind of stuff during this period. Now, back to the whole question of it, right? 
the, the central question is what cultural conflicts arose in the 20s? What role did the emergence of youth versus modern stuff play in these? So in the 1920s, right, you had the urban, so think New York City, movies, concerts, speakeasies, museums, right, more money, more free time. In the rural, you had rural life, less money, more traditional, more religious, not as much free time. So the stereotype was that, you know, rural people were stodgy and backwards, and then rural people thought um, city people lacked morals and family values, right? This is still the argument today that you see um, a lot of times about, like, you know, if it's Democrats versus Republicans or, you know, people that live in higher urban areas than, you know, rural areas. I think I'm going to do this in a two-part thing, so it's not very long. So this will be the end of part one, and I will pick up here with part two for the second lecture.